وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور remember, remember, الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah I'd like to welcome you, dear viewers, to another in our series, In the Names of Allah. And we have been looking at uh, Allah's names from the perspective of understanding them, understanding their meanings, understanding their relevance to us, uh, not just what they mean linguistically, but what they mean in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because oftentimes there is a, a, a gap between what the name means linguistically and what it means when applied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we'll be focusing on is obviously what it means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that aids us in understanding Allah. And in understanding Allah, that should aid us in worshipping Him, because the basic principle that we are following is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَعُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا The most beautiful names all belong to Allah so call on Him with them worship Him through them so this is what we are uh, trying to uh, do by understanding uh, the names how they relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then looking into their relevance to us as human beings, where it is uh, possible for us to reflect these meanings, they have an effect on us, and they should be manifest in terms of our own actions, then we do so, where they are limited to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's nothing of them that we can take on for ourselves, then we praise Allah with them, and that's as far as we go. In this segment, we're looking at the seventh name, Al-Quddus. And this name is mentioned only twice in the Qur'an. One of the times is in Surah Al-Jum'ah, in the first verse. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ الْمَلِكُ الْقُدُّوسِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ All in the heavens and the earth glorifies Allah, the Sovereign, the Holy, the Almighty, the All-Wise. The basic meaning of Al-Quddus uh, is derived from the word Quds. Quds which means basically pure and blessed. So the divine name Al-Quddus, according to the scholars, uh, is that it is, refers to one who is perfectly free from any deficiency. Holy in all aspects. Now in terms of the believer and how that name relates to the believer, first and foremost, that belief, the belief that Allah is free from any weakness or deficiency, should lead the believer to reject any kind of references which would ad address to him or would attribute to him any kind of imperfection. Some of these we can find in the Jewish and Christian scriptures, for example, and in many of the other scriptures. But just as an example, in Genesis 2, verse 2, it states there, and on the seventh day God finished his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. This is the attribution of 
rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an unholy attribute. This is a, an attribute of His creatures. It is not an per- attribute of perfection. It's an attribute of weakness. People rest because of a need to rest. So the attribution, uh, the attribution of this attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is totally inappropriate. We also find in Exodus 32 verse 14, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Repenting. God repenting. Repenting to whom? This whole issue of repentance, this is for the creatures. Those who could do wrong. Those who went after doing wrong, they turn back to Allah in repentance and Allah forgives them of their, of their sin. So this is the process of repentance. So it is inconceivable that Allah would repent. So we would reject all such uh, texts you know, as being either man-made, distorted, interpolated, whatever, but could not possibly be of a revealed text from God. Also, when we reject the deficiencies, we reject deficiencies which include those made by Muslims, wherein they share the opinions of others who look at Islam in a negative light and say, for example, that Allah's laws are backward, they're brutal, they're unjust. For a Muslim to agree to that is to attribute to Allah deficiency. Because a backward law means that it's not suitable for the time, for our times. Allah prescribed it 1,400 years ago, and it's now outdated, not really applicable today. That is a deficiency. Allah who knows the future of human beings, He knows the nature of human beings in human society. Therefore, He shouldn't have to make laws and then have to remake them again. He lays down laws which are suitable for human beings in all times and all places. So, for example, people take the law, the Islamic law regarding polygamy, and they look at this as being backward. Yes, people in the ancient times did it, but it's not suitable to our modern world. And as a result, they either add conditions, so they say you can't do it unless you get your wife's permission, when Allah has already given permission, or they say that you can't do it you know, unless there's something wrong with your wife. She's sick uh, or something. But just to go and take another wife when your wife is perfectly in good health, this is not acceptable. But this was not the way of the first generation. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu didn't marry additional wives because his existing wives were incapable. Uh, same thing with his companions, etc. So the law for polygamy is a law which deals with human need. It's not restricted to the time in which it was revealed. Human society has this need. It has had this need since the earliest of civilizations. It is the norm. Women outnumber men. And polygamy is the way for the excess women in the society to find a home without resorting to being mistresses, uh, lovers, uh, prostitutes, etc., etc. Also, among the laws which may be looked at as brutal is the death penalty. Whether it is by cutting off the head or however it is done. The general position held by many Western countries now is that the death penalty is, is brutal. It shouldn't be applied. People should, lives should not be taken. But this was the revealed law. This was the revealed law from God. And where it is applied, it 
has the impact in society. It may not be applied properly, and so the impact is not what it should be. But we can see, even in a place like America, where the idea of, uh, you know, no death penalty, cancellation of death penalty exists in some states, other states have chosen not to. They continue to apply it. Um, another example in terms of brutal is the cutting off of the hand. Death penalty maybe is more widely used. It's found in many different countries in the world. But cutting off the hand, maybe it is only in Islamic law that we have this law today. They say this is brutal. You chop off this hand, the hand which God has created. That is very brutal. Well, the bottom line is that where it is applied in the society, it has a benefit. A greater benefit than the harm to the individual. Islam looks at the overall society as a whole. And that hand is removed to protect the society. So Allah's law is perfect. Allah's law is perfect in this manner. It's not brutal. Allowing that person a free hand to steal in the society and put everybody else's security at risk. That is brutal. The, 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 the lives and the, the society which functions with thievery, widespread, this is a brutal society. People get their fingers chopped off because somebody wants to get a ring from your finger. People are knocked down, beat up for their shoes that they're wearing or the jacket that they're wearing. I mean, this is brutality. This is the real brutality. And that's happening in the societies that don't apply this law. So, Islam, when it prescribes the removal of a person's hand, this is to protect the society from the greater harm of that individual. And it's not just for any individual. See, because when the law is applied, one has to be aware. One has to be conscious that this law is not just applied for each and every person, anybody who steals anything. There are conditions. If a person steals something which is a part of public property, meaning he owns a part of it from a library, from a public bus, or something like this, then his hand is not going to be cut off. He may be punished in some other way, jailed, whatever, fined, but his hand won't be cut off. Similarly, if somebody drops something on the ground and he picks it up, takes it, his hand won't be cut off for that either. That, there was temptation, so he took it. His hand will be cut off if he picks a pocket, because to pick a pocket, you know, this is not something that temptation came. This is something a person trains for. He trains for it and he takes uh, this with skill. With skill. So this is the hand that is cut off. The hand of the professional thief. With that, dear viewers, we're going to take a brief break here and we'll be seeing you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. When you are weak and the road seems low Remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong. My name is Sharif Tuni, and this is brought to you from Huda TV. Um, in today's edition, we'll be discussing about uh, the day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equated the samawat with darkness, the firmament with darkness, and equated the earth with light. Why? Are there really pillars that cannot be seen? Or is it an unseen oh, pillar? Everything is running, but the relationships are fixed. Yes. So that it would appear to people as if nothing is running, you see. We are destroying the, our environment with our own hands. And that's why the Quran says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون Remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah All praise due to Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. I'd like to welcome you back, dear viewers, to our program in the names of Allah. Prior to the break, we were looking at one of the aspects or the impacts of belief in this name, Al-Quddus, what impact it should have on the life of the believer. We said that it should lead him or her to reject the statements and the arguments of those who would describe Allah's laws as being deficient. 
For him to be holy, the holy, the one free from defect, deficiency, weakness, lack of wisdom, backwardness, brutality, these types of attributes are totally unacceptable. So the believer, when he hears these things mentioned, somebody says, as we said before, that polygamy is a backward law. Muslims shouldn't practice it. We say no. Allah prescribed it. It has benefit for society until the last day of this world. We said also the death penalty. We were speaking about that. And we spoke about cutting off the hand of the thief. That there is benefit in it. Benefit which benefits the, the society as a whole. Sure, for that individual who loses his hands, it is something harmful to him. But the idea of directing an amount of harm to an individual to save the greater society, this is wisdom. This is wisdom. And this is why Allah has prescribed it. Similarly, the uh, issue of female proportions in the inheritance laws. People say today it is unjust. How? You're going to give a woman half of what you give a man when their parents die. Why should that be? Woman is equal to a man. Because this is the way that people are now looking at society as a whole. Whereas Islam, the Quran states that the woman gets half that of a male uh, relative, her brother, you know, when they're dividing up. And this is not in all cases, but in specifically son and daughter, in some other cases, but not in each and every case anyway. But even if we take those cases where this takes place, we have to understand that law within the context of Islamic uh, family uh, responsibilities. In a society where people are on their own, a male looks after himself, females look after themselves. The males have no responsibility for females. Then for us to apply such a law would seem unjust. Each person is responsible for himself. So why should the males get double that of the females? Whereas in Islamic society, the male is responsible for the female. So a uh, father, a man is either a father who is responsible for his daughter, a brother is responsible for his sister. A son is responsible for his mother. You know, every position, a husband is responsible for his wife. Every position in which there is a relationship between a man and a, and a woman, the man is held responsible. That is Islamic law. The man is required to look after his daughter until she gets married and leaves the home. A brother... If parents are dead, a brother is required to look after his sister until she gets married and goes on her own with her husband. A son is required to look after his mother. If the father dies, there's nobody to look after her. Her father is dead. He is responsible to look after his mother fully, completely. So the male always is in a position where he's responsible for a female. As a husband, he must provide and maintain his wife. She doesn't have to work. Her responsibility is to look after the home and the children. His responsibility is to provide a place for her. So, when we look at that division of things, of inheritance within that context, then we can see it's quite reasonable. A portion of the inheritance is divided equally between the son and the daughter. But then an additional portion is given to the son based on the fact that he is responsible for his sister or for his mother, for his daughter, if he has one. Right? So that additional portion is for the additional responsibility. So that law is not unjust. It is perfectly just. It is perfectly fair. It may not be equal but equal is not always just. Equal can be unjust and unfair in some circumstances. The second effect that belief in Allah's name 
Al-Quddus should have is that Allah's purity also affirms the truth of all that He informs His creatures. As Allah said in Surah An-Nisa, verse 87, وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا Whose speech is more truthful than Allah's. Thus, it should serve to remove any doubts that the believer might have in his mind regarding anything which Allah promises. Even if what he has promised is beyond his or her comprehension. For example, Allah promises in Surah Ar-Rahman, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Can the reward for good be other than good? One may receive an evil consequence for a good deed and be discouraged from doing further good. So, one questions, where is the good for the good? The fact that we cannot see good doesn't mean it isn't there. Our belief in Allah as being the pure and the holy should give us the confidence in what He has told us. He has promised that the reward for good is good. So even if what we see in front of us appears to be evil, know that there is good behind it. The third effect of this belief in the divine name Al-Quddus is that it confirms the very purpose of life for the believer. Because the creation of life without purpose would be an act of folly, a senseless act. Creation of life without a purpose. As anything in this world, when somebody does something and has no purpose behind it, we say the person has done a senseless act, a foolish act, something silly. Somebody knocks on your door and you open the door and you ask them, who do you want? They say they don't know. You ask them, why do you knock on my door? They said, you don't know. See, obviously this person has lost it. This is not a sensible person. person doing acts without reason behind it. So Allah tells us in Surah Al-Mu'minun, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Do you think I created you aimlessly and that you will not be returned to me? This is Allah's reminder that there is purpose here and we need to know that purpose and live in accordance with the purpose. Those who fall into uh, the rejection of religion as man-made, they've fallen into this trap. They feel that, yes, there is a God, but all religions, people made them up. Men are interpreting them, so they're, uh, you know, male biased, you know, male, male chauvinist, or whatever. But they believe in God, but they say we don't believe in religion. But what does that mean? It means then, what is our purpose? Well, everybody has to find his own purpose. Then this is confusion. We are created in this world, and Allah didn't tell us the purpose for which we were created. Isn't that something inconceivable? I mean, if we think of having, for example, a factory, and we hire workers to come and work in the factory, but we don't tell them what their jobs are in the factory. So they come to the factory and they just aimlessly walk around because they don't know what they're supposed to do there. We'd say that this is mismanagement. This isn't wise. It's silly. The wise manager, he makes sure everybody who comes to work has a job description. He knows exactly what he's supposed to do there, what his purpose is. Allah is beyond all of that. He didn't create his creatures and not inform them what their purpose is here. So, believing in Allah as being Al-Quddus is believing that he is free from such actions which are aimless. Therefore, there is clear purpose. We need to know it and live in accordance with it. Fourthly, belief that Allah is perfect and free from any deficiencies should also lead the believer to know that his speech, his laws, his divine decrees are all perfect. So, the believer would strive to see perfection in them. And even if he can't see it or she can't see it, 
they believe that it is perfect. And that keeps their faith intact. Now, to some degree, this name has been misused. We find the title given to the Quran as the Holy Quran. But this is in fact really an inappropriate description. Instead, what we find in the Quran is that Allah refers to the Quran as Al-Quran Al-Kareem, the Noble Quran, or Al-Quran Al-Majid, the Glorious Quran, Al-Quran Al-Azim, the Magnificent Quran, Quran Aziz, the Mighty Quran. These are the descriptions which Allah gave to the Quran, but not Al-Quddus. He didn't give the term holy to the Quran. So this usage really is inappropriate. And really it is uh, Muslims being affected by the common practice among Christians to call their scripture the Holy Bible. So the Muslims, not to be outdone, call the Quran the Holy Quran. But it's not really appropriate. But if somebody said to you, what is your holy book? We don't say we don't have a holy book. We say our holy book is the Qur'an. It is the Qur'an. But we don't call it the holy Qur'an. Also giving the Prophet ﷺ the title, the holy prophet. This is also inappropriate. In closing, I'd just like to mention that Prophet Muhammad Wasallam also used the name Al-Quddus in prayer. And Aisha re reported that whenever he was in, in a position of bowing and prostrating, he used to say, Subuhun Quddusun Rabbul Malaikati Warruh, free and pure from defects, Lord of the angels and the spirit. And when he completed the witter prayer at night, he used to also say, Subhan al Malik al Quddus, Subhan al Malik al Quddus, Subhan al Malik al Quddus, Glory be to the Holy King. So this is the way. The Prophet ﷺ used to pray with this name, Al-Quddus. And as such, we should strive to do the same. With that, dear viewers, we'd like to thank you for being with us in this segment of our program, In the Names of Allah. And we'll continue in the next segment uh, with uh, the name, As-Salam, and we hope, inshallah, that you will be with us. As-Salamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong.